Hi, my name is Lavinia. This is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy, a channel to learn board games quickly and easily. Today, I'm very happy to teach and give you tips on how to play the base game of Dune, a competitive game uh, based on one of my favorite books, Dune. Now, for the advanced rules, watch my other video. What I love in Dune is how it brings the book to life with each faction clearly differentiated and true to its role in the story, which is really cool. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. There's a full synopsis of the story and the rules, but for now I'll give you the version of the David Lynch movie introduction. It's the year 10,191. The Emperor rules the known universe. He has just given stewardship of planet Arrakis to House Atreides. Arrakis is a desolate dry planet with vast deserts. It is the home of the Fremen, but it's also the only known source of spice. The spice melange is the most precious substance in the universe because it extends life, it expands consciousness, and is vital for the Spacing Guild to allow space travel. Until now, the Harkonnen, a sinister and underhanded house, controlled Arrakis, while in the background, the Bene Gesserit, an exclusive sisterhood with superhuman powers, tries to influence the destiny of Arrakis, also known as Dune. In the game Dune, each faction has unique advantages, but they all fight for the same thing, the control of Dune, the first player to occupy three strongholds, or four if they are in an alliance, with at least one force on the ninth phase of the turn wins the game. Now let's look at the map of Dune in more detail. Dune is a desert planet. Apart from the five strongholds we've just seen and which are territories marked in dark brown, there are rock territories which are in brown. Everything else are desert territories which are in tan color. There's also the polar sink in white in the middle, which I'll explain later. The map is also divided into 18 sectors, and the storm moves counterclockwise around Dune. Note that some territories are running across several sectors. Some territories are also marked with a spice blow. These show the possible location where spice could appear during the game. These two symbols here represent ornithopters. Factions who control either of them can fly and move three instead of only one territory. Here's where we keep the spice bank. Here are the Tleilaxu tanks where killed forces await resurrection. Here is to keep track of the turns with the game turn marker. Place the turn marker on one. The game will stop at the end of the 10th turn, but that doesn't happen often. Here's also a good reference to keep track of each of the nine faces of each turn. Finally, these circles around the map are for players to place their player marker. Each player places their faction marker on the circle closest to them. Each faction has specific components, but for the base game, they're quite similar. You have five leader discs of varying fighting strength, small tokens called forces, and some starting spice. There's also a player shield that explains the faction strategy and is used to hide from the other players the spice, forces and leaders in reserve. You also start with a handy player sheet which explains your starting positions, forces and spice, special faction advantages and benefits of alliances. The Atreides, led by Paul Atreides, have a limited gift of prescience and can look at the treachery cards before they are auctioned. They can also look at the spice card at the start of the movement phase and during battle, they can ask the opponent to reveal one of the four elements they have chosen to fight. The Harkonnen, led by the decadent Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, excel in treachery. While all other factions start with only one traitor card, they keep all four. And while others have a hand limit of four treachery cards, they can keep up to eight and always receive a free one whenever they buy or receive a treachery card. The Emperor, led by His Majesty the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, has access to great wealth and collects all spies paid during the bidding phase. The Spacing Guild, led by Stearman Edric, controls all shipment on to and off Dune. Whenever a faction ships forces from off-planet reserves, they pay the spice to the Guild, not the Spice Bank. In addition, they are the only faction who can transport forces long distances across Dune and also send forces back to their reserve. Finally, they only pay half price when shipping forces. The Fremen, represented by the planetary ecologist Liet Kynes, are native of Dune and know its ways. During shipment, they can bring any or all their reserve forces for free onto the Great Flat or within two territories of the Great Flat. 
their forces can move two territories instead of one. They can also ride the worm if Shai Hulud appears where they have forces. Instead of being devoured, they move some or all of these forces to any territory subject to storm and occupancy rules. The Bene Gesserit, led by Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Moyham, are adept in the ways of the mind. In addition to normal shipping, they add one spiritual advisor in the polar sink whenever a faction ships forces from off-planet reserves. They can also use the voice, a bit like Jedi's, to force an opponent to use a specific type of card during battle and the opponent must comply. Finally, at the beginning of the game, just after setup, the Bene Gesserit can predict which faction will win and in which turn. They use the prediction cards to do this. This is one of five decks in Dune. Let's start with having a look at the prediction cards. The prediction deck used at the beginning of the game by the Bene Gesserit to predict who might win the game. They pick one faction in one turn number and return the rest to the box. The spice deck to indicate which spice blow creates spice and how much there is to harvest and where the giant sandworms known as Shai Hulud will appear. Shuffle the deck and place it next to the board. The treachery deck provides defenses, weapons, tools and tricks to use in battles. You have defenses against poison or against projectiles, poison and projectile weapons, a special las gun which potentially could blow up in your face, some leader decoys, some cool superpowers, and some completely worthless cards, literally. Shuffle the deck and give one treachery card to each player and place the rest of the deck next to the game board. The traitor deck with one card for each leader in the game. Discard the leaders from the factions not playing and deal four cards to each player. Players select one secretly, except the Harkonnen who keep all four. The alliance deck is used to remind players of the benefit of their alliance. These are used later once alliances are formed. And finally, there's the Storm deck, but put it aside for now as it's only used by the Fremen and the Advanced Rules. Now, draw the factions randomly and distribute the starting spice and forces and we are ready to start playing. Let's start with the first phase of the turn, which is the Storm phase. This is where the Storm is going to move around Dune. The first time the Storm has moved in the game, the two players who are nearest on each side of the storm start, in this case the Emperor and the Fremen. Secretly dial a number between 0 and 20 on the battle wheel. Reveal and add both numbers and move the storm counterclockwise the sum total of sectors. In subsequent turns, the two players who last used the battle wheels do the same, but they can only select a number between 1 and 3. The first player this turn is the one the Storm will next approach, in this case the Fremen. Also, when the Storm passes across sectors, it destroys all forces in sand territories, except the Imperial Basin. Sending these forces to the Tleilatsu tanks, all spice the Storm passes over is also destroyed. Finally, no force can move through, into or out of a sector in the storm, and forces cannot battle if one is in the storm or if they are separated by the storm. The second phase is the spice blow and the nexus phase. This is where we're going to place more spice and sandworms on the map. Turn the top card. Any Shai Hulud card revealed in the first turn is set aside to be reshuffled. If it's a territory, place the number of spice where indicated. Then this card is placed face up on the spice deck discard pile. In subsequent turns, a Shai Hulud card starts a series of events. First, all spices and forces present on the card on top of the discard pile are sent to the spice bank and Tleilaxu tanks respectively. Then another card is revealed from the deck. If it's another Shai Hulud, discard it until a territory is revealed and spice added as explained just now. A Shai Hulud card on the second or subsequent turns causes a nexus at the end of the phase. This is where alliances can be formed or broken. All players can discuss openly the pros and cons of potential alliances, keeping in mind that while there can be multiple alliances, players can only be in one alliance at a time and there can be no more than two players per alliance. And once the alliances are formed, they are revealed to all. All players swap alliance cards as a reminder to all, but also to see the new power they receive from their ally. In addition, from now on, the allies can help each other by paying some or all of the cost of treachery cards, 
by paying for reviving or shipping forces to Dune. They will also need to control four strongholds jointly to win the game. With the exception of the Polar Sink, allied factions can no longer enter the same territory. If they find themselves in the same territory, one will have to move out at the next movement phase. While alliances are public, information shared between allies can be secret. Alliances will remain in play until the next nexus, at which point they can remain as they are or they can be broken. Now, the third phase is the Chome Charity phase. Any player with less than two spies will get to receive charity. Those players receive spice tokens to bring their total to two by calling out Chom Charity. The fourth phase is the bidding phase. This is when players, each in their turn, will bid for the treachery cards. Now, remember that the Atreides will always look at the top card before the bid starts. So it's a good idea for them to manage the bidding deck. Start by distributing one treachery card per player who can bid. The players who already hold four cards or eight for the Harkonnen cannot bid and will have to pass. The top card is now ready to be auctioned for Spice. The first player, that's the one immediately in front of the Storm, starts the auction. That player can bid one or more Spice or pass. The next player, clockwise, who can bid, can raise the bid or pass. Players cannot bid Spice they don't have unless they have an ally and their ally pays for them. This goes on and on until a top bid is made and all others pass. The spice usually goes to the spice bank, but if the emperor plays, he collects the spice instead. The treachery card goes to the highest bidder. The Atreides looks at the next card secretly and a new bid starts from the player on the right of the one who opened the previous bid. This way, all players have a chance to start the bidding. Once all cards have been sold or passed on, the bidding ends. Remember that players only have 10 seconds to make the bid, so it's more exciting. Also, the Atreides player is the only player who can take written notes in the game. It's especially interesting in this space. Finally, the treachery cards cannot be traded or used for bribes, while players can do any kind of deal with players who are not in their alliance. They can only offer spice uh, or information. Now, the fifth phase is the revival phase. This is where players can reclaim up to three forces and one leader from the Tleilaxu tanks. Of those forces, some are free, as stated on the player sheet. The others cost two spice per force. Note that the Emperor can also pay for an extra three forces for his ally. Revived forces are placed in the reserves not on the map. The leader can only be revived if all five leaders were in the Tleilaxu tanks. You can use this leader as usual. It can still be a traitor and it can still be killed. Pay the leader's fighting strength in spice, in this case, three spice. To revive a leader again, all leaders must have died a second time. To keep track, flip the leader face down. All spice paid during the revival phase will go to the spice bank. Now, the sixth phase is the shipment and movement phase. This is where players, starting with the first player and in their turn, will ship forces into Dune and move them. Take forces from your reserve and place them in one single territory in Dune. This costs one spice per force shipped in a stronghold or two per force anywhere else on Dune. If the Spacing Guild plays, pay them instead of the Spice Bank for all shipping costs. Also, the Spacing Guild only pays half that shipping cost. Be clear about the sector you ship to in the territory and remember that you cannot ship into the storm. Also keep in mind that only the Spacing Guild can ship forces back to its reserves. Now, once a player has shipped, it's time to move. Players can move any number of forces, but only once from one territory to another. Also, the Bene Gesserit ship one force into the Polar Sink every time another faction ships forces onto Dune. All factions by default can only move on foot to one adjacent territory. In the strongholds, there can be no more than two factions. Forces in Arakeen or Kothag have access to ornithopters. Also remember that forces cannot move into, through or out of the storm sector. Finally note that the Polar Sink is never in the storm. Also the Polar Sink is a safe haven where no battles can take place. Everywhere else during the seventh phase, brutal battles must be resolved where forces are in the same territory. If they are separated by the storm, they cannot battle.
The first player, or if they are not engaged in battle, the next player to the right is named the aggressor. The aggressor chooses which battle they want to fight first. If three or more factions are present in the same territory, the aggressor decides which faction they battle first, second or third, for as long as they survive. Battles continue until one or no faction remains in the territory. To resolve a battle, each player selects secretly four elements. The number of forces engaged in the battle using the battle wheel from zero to the number of forces in the territory. But remember that even in case of victory, all these forces will be discarded to the Tleilaxu tanks, so it might be useful not to commit to all the forces. If possible, include a faction leader like this. Its battle strength is added to the number of forces engaged by the wheel. Be careful though, if that leader turns out to be a traitor, the battle will be lost immediately. Alternatively, you can use a cheap hero card to replace the leader disc. If you cannot use a leader disc or card, you must announce it and cannot play treachery cards. Otherwise, add up to two treachery cards, one defense and one weapon of your choice. In a real game, this would be done in secret and when both players are ready, they would both reveal their battle plan at the same time. The winner is the player with the highest total number of forces on the battle wheel added to the leader's strength. In case of a tie, the aggressor wins. If a player played a weapon and the opponent did not counter with a matching defense, then their leader is killed and does not count in the total battle strength. If both leaders are killed, neither count in the battle. Killed leaders are placed in the Tleilaxu tanks and the winner of the battle collects their strength in spice, even for their own leader. Surviving leaders remain in the territory and could battle again in this territory. The losing player discards all its forces from the territory to the Tleilaxu tanks. However, the winner only loses the forces engaged in the battle. The losing player also discards all the treachery cards involved in the battle while the winner has the option to keep or discard them. Remember that leaders can only be killed by a special weapon. Otherwise, they will go back to the reserve even if they lost the battle. That, of course, is if there is no traitor in play. But that's what makes fighting in Dune such a nerve-wracking event, especially against the Harkonnens. If a player owns the traitor card of the leader the opponent has just played and chooses to reveal it, the battle stops immediately. The player who revealed the traitor wins the battle, loses nothing, no matter what. The treacherous leader is sent to the Tleilaxu tanks and the winner gets that leader's strength and spice. The loser discards all the cards played. If both players reveal a traitor, then they both lose their forces, their cards, their leaders, and no one gets any spice. Now, the eighth phase is the spice harvest phase. This is where players who are in the same territory will get to harvest spice. All players can collect two spice per force present in the territory in which they're spice. They can collect three per force if they also occupy Carthag or Arakeen. Uncollected spice remains in the sector. Finally, the ninth phase is the Mentat pause phase. This is where factions can declare winner or winners. If there's no winner, then you move the turn marker one space clockwise. However, if a faction has at least one force in each of three strongholds, or an alliance of factions controls four strongholds, they are declared the winner. Unless the Bene Gesserit predicted it, in which case they win alone. The Fremen also have a special victory condition. If at the end of the 10th turn, no faction has won, and if the Fremen or no one occupies Siege Tabar and Habania Siege, and neither Harkonnen, Atreides, nor Emperor Force occupies 2x Siege, they win. Finally, the Spacing Guild also has a special victory condition. If no faction controls Dune at the end of 10 turns, they automatically win the game. Note that every time a faction's special advantage contradicts the rules, the faction's special advantage always takes precedent. Now, secrecy is important in Dune, and although players can reveal their forces, spies, cards, or traitors, they can never be forced to reveal them. The only thing that should be public is the number of treachery cards. <laughs> My tips to win at Dune are, be careful not to spend all your spice, especially at the first bidding phase. While battles can bring huge rewards and are vital to win the game, be very cautious as they can be devastating. If you have seen some of your leaders at the beginning of the game, you know they are not traitors, so you should use them in battles that are very important. Alliances are very helpful, and you should try to make them at the first nexus. Ideally, choose a faction that complements you well. 
Also, remember that alliances can be broken at the next nexus, so don't put all your hopes of winning with your ally. When in doubt, it's usually best to follow the normal inclinations and advantages of your faction. For your first games at two, three, or four players, use the factions that are recommended in the rules. So that's how you play Dune. It's a game of superlatives. It's epic, exhilarating, and devious. It's very tense from the first phase of the first turn and does not let go. The battles are brutal, and the speed at which fortunes change is awful. All this gets amplified the more players you have. This is not a game for the faint of heart, but it's brilliant for avid gamers. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe or leave in the comments a game you'd like me to teach. I'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.